Note that Monday lessons tend to not go always as planned, so I kind of rely on Thursdays because I've kind of ironed out the bugs by the time I get to you guys. So I'm hoping this class will go pretty decent. All right. Um, some housekeeping, I guess, first. So I know everybody kind of saw my messages over the weekend about the midterms. Uh, there was also some issues with assignments as well. Uh, those who had any issues have been contacted already. <coughs> Long story short, what I came to as a decision, I'm going to leave everything as is. Um, those who I've talked to and resolved with, um, the resolutions have happened. Those who received a zero, it's maintaining as a zero for cheating. Um, those who got caught with a second academic offense through uh, also cheating on the assignment um, and filing academic misconducts, as I told you guys before, it's a two-strike policy with me and then I'm basically fucking done at that point. <clears throat> but the whole thing is, it leads back to the whole idea that there, there's a couple of problems I find with these type of classroom setups in Georgian. One, you're right side by side. There's no way around that. There's, there's nothing I can do to fix that, unfortunately. Everybody's side by side. In university, there's like rows upon rows of like desks and stuff. And usually you can sit one away from each other and it's a little easier. So they'll give like one type of task. Sometimes they'll do two. I'm finding that I need like four to five different types of tests in order to stop cheating. Um, so for the last test, it will be dynamic. Uh, the last test will also be a little bit more logic problems than just step by step. So instead of me giving you step one, write a for loop, step two, do this thing, it will be um, using iteration, sum this array will be what the thing will be. So you'll have to apply logic in order to do that step and solve that problem. The benefits to that is your code should be fairly unique to somebody else's code, right? You should never have the same variable names, your code structure should be roughly different because everybody has their own kind of style to coding. Um, so it'll be a lot easier to pick those out that are cheating and it'll also help you, um, I don't know, plus with the dynamics of the questions being dynamically generated, it should also stop people you know, from reading over your shoulder and kind of copying from you that way as well, right? So that's the idea. So, um, and the reason why I bring that up is because a few people kind of got screwed over by the people sitting beside them, which, you know, isn't fair to them. So, uh, obviously, we want to mitigate against that, too, and that obviously is a result of, you know, a classroom built for 40 people, and the class is 40 people. So, it makes it kind of difficult to spread out. Anyway, so that is that. <clears throat> if you haven't talked to me yet, and you did receive a zero, I will be here for a little bit after class. I do recommend talking to me, but I can't stay forever because it's obviously 10 o'clock. Um, and I'd like to go home, too, at that point. <clears throat> All right, that's that. Awkward conversation out of the way. Uh, let's talk about this thing. So we, last week, uh, we did we did our first DOM piece. Yeah, you guys weren't here last week. So the cool thing about that, what I did, instead of actually recording a lesson and putting it online and getting you guys to do the lesson, because we're talking about DOM events, I find that a little hard to just record a lesson and put it online. It tends to get lost in translation. So I would rather teach you that lesson. So instead, to make up for the lesson that we lost last week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to uh, basically sign up for a Netlify account, activate a Netlify account, how to deploy to Git, how to get your application that you put on Git into Netlify, uh, how to install Node, and how to install Live Server. So that'll be like a nice little bonus lesson that will record to YouTube for you, and you're welcome to view it any time. It will not be on the test. So that's the good thing about it. It is purely just a nice little bonus lesson, okay? <laughs> it works out because next week, if I pull up my notes, not that, that's Monero stuff, outline, do all cloud outline. All right, so here's class outline. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, we are on week not, uh, eight, so that's DOM events. So next week is self describing data, which is XML and JSON. It's a pretty tiny lesson. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take week nine and I'm going to take week 12, which is cookies and local storage, and I'm going to combine them together and we're going to do that next week, which works out because 
um, local storage is key value pairs, which is what JSON uses anyways. So the, the things kind of go together. The cookies are key value pairs as well. So everything kind of goes together on that lesson. So we're going to do that. So the bonus thing, it's not like you'll be losing a lesson. You still have all the same material you would have had originally, just one's being condensed as one big lesson. All right? So there's that. Cool. So that means last time we talked, we did this lesson, which was the advanced DOM techniques, right? We did that. We did creating DOM and removing DOM elements. Okay. <laughs> I hope we did, because people are looking at me a bit confused. I, mean, I can always go to YouTube and find out what I taught, because I can't always remember. Um, okay. Just uh, So we recapped. We talked about introducing the DOM, how we can actually select elements from the DOM, right? For those of you that are looking at me a little bit confused, like maybe like, what's the DOM again, right? Well, the DOM is a representation of your HTML page. It's a document object model. It's basically a spec that represents the HTML page and provides you through the, the JavaScript API a way to be able to access the different HTML elements on your page. Like for example, any website, right? Go to a website, choose view page source, you get this wonderful structure here, right? What is this stuff called? What is this code called? Yeah, it is source code, but what is it specifically? What language is that specifically? Yeah, it's HTML, right? And HTML is actually just XML, right? Which is, essentially, we're going to talk about self-describing data next week. This is self-describing data. So <laughs> it's HTML, but the problem is it's like, Interacting with HTML with JavaScript would be very difficult if we had to use the tags and everything and try to figure out how to do it that way. So they give us a nice tool, a library basically, in order to interact with this fairly simply. And that's our DOM. So our DOM will actually allow us to be able to access different HTML elements as we would an object, for example. It gives us an object representation of it. And each one of those things has some nice cool properties and some methods on it that we can access and use, which makes it very simplistic and very powerful for us to actually work with our DOM. So the last time we spoke, we took a look at how to actually get those tags off the screen and into our application so that we can start to work with them. And so that's when we got into how to actually access this. And we took a look at the selection methods, right? The query selector, uh, the query selector all, which are the ways, are the two methods that you use for actually query, like querying the DOM structure and being able to access different DOM elements, right? And uh, that should be a recap because we did it once before. Uh, then we took a look at how to access and store you know, specific elements, if they're nested, we talked about CSS nesting, where you actually use the CSS to walk the DOM and grab the element that you want that might be nested somewhere. And we also took a look at DOM walking, which is where you select a DOM element back, and then using that DOM element as scope, you then do another query selection and find the next element that you need within its nesting, right? So we did all that. Then we talked about creating DOM elements. So creating a DOM element, up to this point, we had selected on elements that were already existing on the page. Creating a DOM element allows you to create a brand new element, a document fragment, that you can now put into the page, right? Uh, so you can customize it, modify it, use programming to create multiple iterations of it, do whatever it is that you want to do programmatically. And then when you're done and you want to actually render it on the page, what two methods can we use in order to actually put it on the page? Because remember, it doesn't exist until we actually call one of these two methods. Do you remember? Text What's that? Text Not text content, no. Append. Yeah, exactly. Append and prepend. So append and prepend will actually allow us to then apply it to another DOM element. So we have to select another DOM element like the body or a paragraph or a UL or whatever it is we want to select. And then we just call append on that and pass it the element we created, right? Which is pretty cool. We talked about adding attributes to it. Attributes are like, you know how HTML tags have IDs, they have name, they have title, they have data attributes. There's a whole bunch of different little attributes. Class, for example, style. There's a whole bunch of different little attributes that are available to you on the HTML tag. Obviously, you need some way to be able to manipulate those with the DOM API. And you have that. So for example, if it's the ID, you can simply just call .id. If it's a data attribute, you have to use the data set 
uh, property and then you can just create whatever property you want on it and then that will create data dash in this scenario feeling. Uh, if you want to modify the styles, you simply access the style property and then whatever particular CSS attribute it is that you want to modify. Text, you just say modify the text content. Or if it's an input, what do you modify? Because it's not text content if it's an input, it's what? In order to change, what's that? Yeah, exactly, value. You would modify the value. Class list allows you to manipulate the CSS classes that you've applied to the element, right? So um, EM or text, or if you're using Bootstrap, BTN, BTM primary, whatever the classes are that you're working with, the class list is how you can add remove and like we're going to look at today there's another one called toggle which basically if it's there uh, it'll remove it if it's not it will add it which is kind of handy when you're trying to turn something on and off and then we use prepend to actually apply it so once it's applied we get this wonderful thing I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it which is HTML right so that whole big block uh, gives us the ID Fred as a feeling uh, data feeling attribute uh, with the value hooray, adds a class with a couple of classes inside of it, right? And it builds that out for us. Cool. We talked about working with templates, which was our way of being able to get our HTML out of our uh, JavaScript, put our HTML in a logical place like our uh, HTML page. The cool thing about templates um, is that you can create all the ones you want, they, you know, especially usually for redundant things, that's what you're going to tend to use them for. Say you have like products, right? And every product's going to roughly look the same. It makes more sense to create a template for those products because that template isn't going to render, right? So you have this template on your HTML page. It doesn't render to the browser so the user doesn't see it. But now you can still, using Query Selector, you can still grab the template manipulate it however you want, replace the data inside of it dynamically, and then go ahead, make a clone of it using import node, and then append that clone to the screen, right? But at least your HTML is with the rest of your HTML. Your styling is in your CSS. It's not all sitting there contaminated inside your JavaScript, which makes more sense. It's, it's a lot easier to maintain tiny code blocks than it is to maintain some massive conglomerate of code, right? So when this clones block of code right there? Yeah, so what it'll do is it'll clone all of this, right? And then it will store it into clone. Um, so here it is, we are selecting it, right? right? Then we're importing it, but we're not importing just it, we're actually importing its content, which is just this piece inside. This second argument, true, it does it recursively. So if you have multiple nestings, it'll just recurse through and grab all the nesting and pull it all back out, which is important. And then you can modify it if you want to, like change its style or whatever else you want to do, just like you would with any other HTML element. And then when you're done, you just go ahead, select some random well, not random, select whatever element it is you want to append to, and then append it to the element. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, so then we talked about removing DOM elements. Removing DOM elements, very, very simple, right? Just simply select the element you want, and then go ahead and call remove on it. If I remove it, can I get it back? Yeah. That's the only way. Exactly, just like Mo said, the only way for me to get it back is to refresh the page. And that's because when you remove it, it actually pulls it from the DOM and completely removes it. Even if you try to save it to a variable, like say, um, say instead of just body.remove, uh, we wrote const um, bdog equals uh, body.remove. It's going to remove the element, but it actually doesn't return anything back. It returns back undefined, which means it's not like you're going to like pop it out of the DOM and make it a document fragment and let it float around in the ether and you can store it and then reapply it. So the only way around that, if you're going to remove an item but you eventually maybe want to put it back, um, what can we do? What would be the best approach in order to remove an item but then in the future be able to put it back. 
Yeah, exactly. It makes more sense to clone that item, store it, go ahead and remove the original, and then when you're ready to put it back, you just put the clone back, right? So that's what you would do in those scenarios. It's not something that comes up very often, at least not in a lot of the code I've done I've had to do that, um, but it is something to be aware of. But just to kind of add a little bit to most point about refreshing, the reason why refreshing works to bring it back is because the browser is stateless, right? It means that the browser does not maintain its current state. So if you remove items, if you modify styles using JavaScript, if you modify the values of things or change the text of those things, the second you hit refresh, all that stuff, all that hard work you just did disappears, right? And the reason is, is because the browser doesn't maintain state. It's relying on your CSS file in order to figure out what its current state is. It's relying on your JavaScript file in order to know what its current state is or your HTML. Anything you do inside the browser itself doesn't keep that state until you, like when you refresh. It's not like a server, right, where you have full control over the server. So you can save things to sessions. You can save things to a database or a flat file, right, so that you can maintain their state. And you might argue, maybe you know a little bit about cookies, and maybe you know a little bit about local host. And you might say, well, I can use those things to save state. But just out of curiosity, give me a show of hands. How many people think that cookies and local storage are reliable? Good answer. They are not. They are not reliable. The reason is, is because you don't own those things. The user does. It's their browser, and however they set up their browser is entirely up to them. Uh, for example, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a little cookie icon I've got up there. And when I hover over it, it says disable cookies. And if I click that, that disables cookies. So now, if you attempt to save a cookie to my browser, I'm not going to let you. You can't actually save it. Uh, if you want to use my local storage, I can also prevent that so that you can't use my local storage. There's a lot of things that I can prevent so that you can't gain access. Even if you're trying to be smart, and I don't know, say you do an Ajax call and save my session and save some details about me and everything else, I can still clear all those things, right? So you can't reliably guarantee um, that you can save my state. And because of that, you should never guarantee that. You should never be banking on the ability to save someone's state. That's something that needs to happen server side. Server side, you can save state. And even then, you obviously need the user to do things for you in order for you to save their state, which is logging in, so you can at least associate them with a state, right? Those pieces are definitely important in order to save state. Not so much an importance right particular in this lesson, but definitely an important thing to think about uh, when you guys start working with server-side languages, as you are, right? Because you're doing ASP.NET. Are you guys building login forms? Saving crap to databases? Yeah, you're saving state, essentially. When you guys do that, you're creating state and saving state. That's what's happening. Have you guys worked with cookies at all? What about sessions? They've gotten you to do some session stuff? Yeah. In PHP, you would have did session stuff, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, we talked about removing elements. And like I said, it doesn't matter. You can remove as many as you want. Uh, and then in the end, we had some fun, and we built a tic-tac-to-go game that I think nobody's worked in this class, or did anybody's work in this class? Yours worked, didn't it, Dante? No, no. No? Did yours work? Yeah, there you go. So a few of yours worked, right? Um, yeah, okay, so today we're going to try to build Simon Says. <laughs> I don't know, it might be optimistic, but I've done some of the code for you, so it should hopefully go pretty good. I know on Monday it got real noisy with just like ding, ding all over the place, which is kind of fun, but uh, yeah. So, but before we do that, we're obviously gonna have to learn some groundwork in order to do that. And that brings us to our next lesson, which are DOM events. Why is this using crappy non-SSL? Really bizarre. <laughs> all right. This is the meat and potatoes of JavaScript, right? DOM events. This is why people like JavaScript. Um, Rick, actually, who just left there. He told me in your Java class, you guys actually learn a little bit about the DOM. Well, not DOM, but you learn 
a bit about events. Because you guys create GUIs, right? In Java? Yeah. yeah. So you know those buttons you're creating, right? In the background, there has to be an event listener for those. There has to be something listening for that click, right? And then when that click happens, you guys are binding a function, right? You register a method or some sort of action to happen when the person clicks the button. That doesn't happen magically in Java, right? I'm assuming you have to actually go code something, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in JavaScript, it's not any different. There's an event system in the background in your browser, and the event system's always running, and you can't, you can't create a new one. <laughs> you can't do anything really with it uh, under the hood, so to speak. Like you could in Java, for example, you could like technically thread up your own event listener and like start sending out multiple threads of event listeners. But in JavaScript, you don't quite have that power. In JavaScript, there's an event listener in the background, and there's like a whole whack of events that come by default, and they're on any element inheriting from the event target. So let's take a look back. Like if we go back and we talk about um, the event target system, uh, let's see, that would have been week, doo -doo -doo. I think that was the week we introduced the DOM, comes into this thing here. So there's the event target, right, at the top there. Then we have node, then we have element, right? And then we have this thing we talk about every single week since we took this first lesson, which is the HTML element, right? Every HTML tag we select from our HTML page and we bring back into our JavaScript as a HTML element is that thing. And they all inherit from the event target, which means they all have the event system available to them. And we can actually subscribe them to the event system. Actually, in fact, they already are. They, they come pre-subscribed. And the events they're actually listening to by default right off the bat, is on click. They're automatically listening to on click. They're automatically listening to mouse down and mouse up, right? So when you click and then, so that's an event. And then when you release, that's an event. They're listening for mouse over. So when your actual cursor has gone over top of the element, they're listening to mouse out. They listen to focus. Focus is a weird one. It basically is like, I'm paying attention to you. That's, that's essentially what it is. Hello, element. I'm paying attention to you. This is something you use for... Um, it's more prevalent with form elements, right? Like input boxes. Because it basically tells the input box, hey, I'm paying attention to you. I have my cursor sitting inside my input box. Right? Cool. Blur, which means I'm now ignoring you. <laughs> I have moved on and found something better with my life. So now I am no longer paying attention to you. So that's blur, right? And then there's change, which is where you've actually changed the value. Again, more prevalent with a form element, such as like select boxes or input boxes. You change the value to be something else. It is applicable to other elements, um, but it's a lot more difficult, obviously. Then there's also, so there's change, and then there's on input. On input is a little different than change. Change, say I have a box. What the hell is all this crap? Ugh. This guy. Let's put his stuff away or erase his board. All right. Let's create an input box. That was terrible. Whatever. Let's put a value in it. Cool. All right? All right. I'm going to change this. I'm bringing my cursor in, and I go one. And then I leave the input box, and that's when the change event goes, ting, change has occurred, change. But I had to leave the box for the change event to occur. Input is a little different. Input to bang, the input has fired. The second I add a character in there, input fires. And it's like, you've done things, things have happened, Execute whatever's listening to this particular event. And so that will fire off whatever the event is. So that's on input. There's a big laundry list of events inside this wonderful table down here. <coughs> There's on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on mouse down. I think it's every one we talked about. The only one we didn't mention was on submit. On submit happens when you actually submit a form, right? 
And even though you may have not ever heard of that before, you have encountered it, I guarantee it. When you submit a form, people generally don't want to just submit your form with your crazy potential malicious input, right? They don't know what you've typed in those fields. They want to sanitize them. They want to validate them. They want to normalize it, right? The three most common steps with any form input, validate, sanitize, normalize. And because of that, what they will do with JavaScript to give you a better user experience instead of you know, having you pass all this information to the server, then go through and go, oh, this isn't what I need, and then they reroute you back to where you were before, and they have to repopulate your form, and you have to go through all those steps. To avoid that and give you a better user experience, they use JavaScript, they stop the on-submission from happening, and they validate your fields. And then they take you and they put you using focus into the field that has a problem and say, hey, dude, this is wrong, you need to fix it. Right? So you have encountered that, I'm sure, uh, especially with things like newer sites like Amazon, any of the Google stuff, right? Any of that stuff, I'm sure you've encountered on that, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, right? And it is something, hopefully, once you guys are finished your JavaScript course, you will consider, if you're building your own websites, to give a user a better experience by incorporating those type of things as well. User experience is important. Love them or hate them, you got to, unfortunately, please the user, right? Because they pay the bills. <laughs> All right, so I just slapped you with a whole ton of information. So let's uh, slow it down and work it out a little bit more. So an event is an interaction. Interaction is usually something physical, like a click, mouse down, mouse up. I don't know why Nestor's smirking, but <laughs> when I said it's an interaction. <laughs> but it's like it's a physical interaction, not sexual. It's just physical interaction. <laughs> That is registered with the document. Usually, the events are physical. They don't always have to be. An event can be literally anything. Like, for example, in our system, we have events occurring because a function ran. So some random function went off in our system, and boom, this event occurred, and everything listening to that event all of a sudden fires off. That's not a physical interaction. That's just a function executing, right? But it is possible. But generally, the ones that we're going to work with um, will all be physical interactions from the user. So like clicking, hovering, moving your mouse, pressing a key, yet yeah, you can actually check when a user presses a key. That's why you can play some of those interactive online games, right, where you move the little guy left and right, hit the space bar and he jumps and all that type of stuff. And scrolling. Have you guys ever went to a website with parallax effect? That's where you scroll and things like the background moves and the foreground moves at a different pace. That's all because they're detecting the scrolling and they're doing some math in order to move things at different paces in the background. That's all done with JavaScript. But events aren't limited to any of these interactions. Like I said, they can be triggered with things the system is doing or the document is doing. There are events already built into JavaScript that do that. Like for example, when your page loads, it fires the on load event and tells the system that the page is loaded. What that basically means is your HTML is rendered. I have loaded in your CSS, and I have loaded in your JavaScript. I have no clue if it's done executing, but it's loaded. That's basically what that means, right? And there's other things too, like on readies and stuff like that. And then there's a whole bunch that get provided through frameworks like jQuery and stuff. But they're very important because these events are insanely powerful, right? They provide us a way of making sense and interacting with an environment that kind of runs a bit at a time, right? It, you never know when things are going to finish, and that's where the event system becomes integral because it's telling you when things are done, right? So events occur on any object inheriting from the event target, as I demonstrated, which basically covers all the HTML elements that we have been selecting. When an event is published, and I like to use these words, published and subscribed, because it's a paradigm that you should be constantly thinking about, especially now that a lot of the uh, industry is starting to head into publishing and subscribe paradigms, which is basically how to handle um, code that is kind of broken up into two steps. Uh, basically, the way publishing works is something publishes a message, and then everything listening to that message will execute but the publisher doesn't need to care about that. It can be completely disconnected. All it has to do is publish the message, right? So that's kind of a good paradigm. It makes coding a little bit cleaner, it turns our code into something called microservices, which are little maintainable blocks. Um, <laughs> anyways, so when an event is published, 
it will cause all the elements listening to that event to execute the very dreaded callback, right? That wonderful thing we all love coding. Yeah. That is registered to the event. However, there's a gotcha within the current DOM node stack. Now, that sounds crazy complex, but it really isn't. The DOM node stack. I got a div, and in my div, I got a UL, and in my UL, I have an LI, and I have an LI, and I have an LI, right? That's my node stack, okay? I add an on click equals, I'm gonna draw one of those little mathematical functions. <laughs> it's equal to a function, right? When this click occurs, like it says, it will execute a callback that is registered to that event. So this is the callback registered to this on click event within the current DOM node stack. So basically, this child, its parent, and its grandparent. So that click event will bubble, 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 all the way up to the top and fire off through everything through that current node stack, including into the body, like once it reaches the body. So anybody listening to this event will execute whatever function is registered to them. So if this UL has an on click, right? it's going to fire off its function as well, right? And that just because everything listening to the event will fire it off. Once again, publishing doesn't care. It just publishes the on click. Everybody subscribed to it are gonna execute, but only within the tree. The general process of subscribing to an event is these four steps. Select an element from the DOM. Bind an event listener to the element. Well, they're already bound, on click, on, Mouse down, on mouse over, they're already bound. Register a callback function to the bound event. So basically, on click equals whatever your function is. And then profit, right? Because now you have a nice user interaction spirit. Hopefully. This is what it looks like in code. We first select the element that we want to play around with, right? Then we choose one of the many event properties that are available to us. There's on click, there's on mouse down, mouse up, right? On hover. No, there is not on hover, which is weird. We have on click, but we don't get on hover. Um, anyways, on mouse down, we make it equal to a function, right? And then we just do whatever logic we're going to do inside our function. When the user clicks the button, or yeah, so when they click and their mouse makes the down point, even when they release, it doesn't matter that event has happened, it will then fire off this function, which will execute that code. Let's do it. So we have step one. Select an element from the DOM, clicking. So it's going to be this button that you see over here in the HTML, which has an ID called clicking. All right. So we're going to select that. So uh, let's put it in a variable called clicker. And we all know how to actually select an element on the page. Query selector. Sounds like a transformer. And it'll be hashtag, what did I call it? Clicking? Clicking. Hashtag clicking. All right, and if you click execute, and then you click the click me, it does nothing yet, because we haven't actually bound anything to it. It doesn't have a registered event. However, it is doing things. It's still calling that on click property. <coughs> When we click that button, it's literally going, hey, ho, 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 this guy clicked. And I have a bound event on me called on click, because it does, because all those events are already bound to it. So it's like, I'm going to call on click. But on click is currently equal to undefined. There's no function registered to it. So we're going to correct that. We're going to register a function to it. Bind the on -click, on click event to the element and register the callback function to the bound event. Well, we're going to do clicker dot on click which is already available to it equals and this is where now when we actually click that button it will wind up executing whatever we do that it's equal to so we have to give it a callback function that is the requirement so we're going to say function we'll just do an anonymous function and uh, why don't we do an alert hello everybody there we go
I was doing this on Monday, and unfortunately, I had filled out all of these, and with all the stuff that I was dealing with with the test, I completely forgot to erase all the code. <laughs> so it was already in place, so we were just basically explaining it. No interaction. kind of sucked. So I made sure I fixed that for you guys. All right, go ahead and click Execute. Then click Click Me. And if you did it correctly, you should get your little alert box. It should pop up and say, hello, everybody, or whatever you wrote. And the way this works, the reason why this is working is because in the background there's this event listening system that is always listening, right? It can always hear when these things happen. And when it happens, when this click happens on that element, it's like totally cool. Let's go into that element. Let's grab the on click event. Let's execute whatever function is bound to that thing. And bam, then we alert everybody, right? Very cool, very interactive. Incidentally, this execute button that we click doesn't look any different. When you click execute, I have a bound function to the on click event that executes when you click it and parses your code and executes your code for you. Same idea, just a little bit more complex. The function's more complex, but the actual work that actually puts that all together is exactly the same. There's no difference. <coughs> Let's talk about a very, very, very important argument called the event target. So as with most callbacks that we work with, right, like when we do filter or map or reduce, any of those guys that we've done on the array or for each, right, all of those give us a callback. And when we call that callback, we get an argument. Every time the callback calls its function, it passes in an argument. With the array callbacks, it always passes whatever item it's currently on as an argument to whatever callback function we assign. These are no different. They actually pass an argument, a very important argument called the event object. The event object contains a whole bunch of information that we need. It contains information basically about, you know, where the click happened on the screen, like literally the x, y coordinates of where that click occurred. I've seen very cool software like the whiteboard app, AWS whiteboard I think it's called, and it allows you to actually draw with your mouse on a whiteboard that's then shared collaboratively with your friends. So you can actually all interact with this whiteboard at the same time. I mean, there's, it winds up resulting in a ton of penis pictures, but it's still a whiteboard, right? <laughs> it's, it's interactive and it's all done with JavaScript using Canvas, but it's still done with JavaScript. And basically what they're doing is as you move your mouse across the page, it's picking up the XY location and it's drawing a pixel and it keeps doing that as your mouse moves across the page, right? And it fills it in. And that's why that's important to you. You get that back from the event object. <clears throat> you also get back whether the event is bubbling. Remember how I showed you the node tree? And if you click the LI, it bubbles up to the UL and basically anybody listening to that will execute their function. Sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want to click the child and not have it execute all the registered events above it. In order to stop that, you can actually tell it, no, I don't want bubbling on this particular event. I want it to, you know, not bubble. I just want it to execute itself and be done. <coughs> so you can actually control that from there. You can also control, you know, uh, which particular target is being affected. Sorry, which target was affected you can access the target property of the event object and it will tell you exactly which HTML element was clicked or interacted with. And that's really, really important because sometimes we're working with a whole bunch of elements that have the same event bound to them. So say we have 16 LIs and all those 16 LIs have an on-click function, and all 16 of those on-click functions all have the same function bound to them. When we click one, we need to know what to do with it. We Say we want to change its color, right? We need to know which one we're changing the color. We can't just go grab the LI and change the color because we'll change the color of every single one of them. We want to change the one that we're interacting with. Well, the event target is what makes that possible because the event target comes back and it gives us a reference of that HTML element. In fact, it's a little bit more complex than that. Actually, uh, no, it's a little bit more simpler. So 
it works because the target is a property of the event object. The target has a value, and that value happens to be a reference to your HTML element. Remember I showed you pass by reference, pass by value, right? And we took a look at it that when you're passing objects by value, it basically just creates a reference point to where that object is in memory. Event target is exactly that. It's just a reference point to that HTML object's location in memory. So when you access the event target, you're accessing that specific HTML element in the DOM, exactly right where it's located. And so you can manipulate it, and you're manipulating the exact one that was interacted with. Okay? So let's, uh, let's do something here. Down below, I have a whole slew of buttons. See all these wonderful buttons here? We're going to select those buttons, and we're going to use the event target to do it. Before we do that, we're going to go equals... And I have no idea what they're called. I think I wrote it down, though. Multi-event. So how do I select multiple elements again? Query selector all. Yep, query selector all. Dot multi-event. That's one word, which is nastily <coughs> being blocked. I'm going to fix this. Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. I want... Whatever is currently condensing that. Hold on. It's making it too tiny, and I want it to be the full screen size. There it is. Nope, that's not a thing. Cool. All right. There we go. That's a little better. All right, step two. Iterate and bind an event to the buttons. Okay, well, we know how to iterate, so we're going to do four... And what kind of for loop should I use if buttons is a node list? It's the same one we would use if it was an array. The for of one? Is that enhanced? Do you call it enhanced? Is it for of whatever? Or is that the one with the colon? Yeah, we don't get the colon. We have to use the literal word of, unfortunately. But you are on the right track. So we'll do let button of buttons. I guess this of would be replaced by a colon if it was JavaScript, or Java, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we wanted to, we could use callbacks with for each, but I always find that gets a little bit, you know, kind of convoluted. <clears throat> Next semester, we'll be looking at promises and async and await, which makes callbacks basically done. You don't use them anymore. Step three, pass the event argument can be any symbol name you want it to be, right? So uh, let's see here. We're going to do button dot on click equals function. And then inside these brackets, we're going to need event. And then step four, only turn this HTML element pink, not everyone pink. So that's the thing. We don't want to just grab all the buttons and then iterate through them and make them pink. We don't want to select a new HTML element on the page by multi-event and make it pink. We want to use the event to make the thing we're currently interacting with pink. So what we can do is we can do event dot target. And event.target will actually return the current button that was clicked. So whatever button it is, that HTML element is what event target is going to be equal to. Okay? And then it's just a matter of going dot style, dot color, actually dot background color equals pink. And you don't have to do pink. You can do orange, blue, black, whatever. Change the stacks. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> All right, once you're done, go ahead and click Execute. I'll just give you a minute. It looks like some people are still typing. Then you can scroll down to where the buttons are. Try clicking the buttons. The ones you click should turn pink. The other ones should remain green. All right, so go ahead and scroll down. Click a button. Cool, it's pink. 
it's pink. But notice not every single button on the page is turning pink, only the ones I actually interact with, right? So <coughs> you would have to create a second on-click function, or in that same on-click function, you would have to basically check to see if the uh, class exists. Um, if, if it's already pink, if it's already pink, then remove it, otherwise make it pink. What was the toggle you were talking about? Toggles for classes. So what you could do in that scenario is if you created a CSS class called pink or whatever, make it so that it changes the background of whatever the class is attached to, pink, then you could just simply toggle the class. So when they click it, it toggles the class. That's literally all you would have to do. That would be the literally the fastest way to do it. Class in the HTML tag. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what? Why don't we? Why don't I demonstrate it? <coughs> so, um, what am I going to have to do it to every single one of them? Actually, we can do this programmatically. Come up here with the buttons. Inside the for loop, do button dot class list. Actually, no, no. Hold on. Uh, how are we going to do that? Style. How the hell would we do that? That's going to be a pain. Uh, All right, do this. Right click on one of the buttons, choose inspect. Okay. Down here at the bottom, where it says element style, we're going to add a new. And we're going to call this dot made it pink, like so. And then we're going to do background pink. Like so, okay. That's gonna create a style in our HTML, <coughs> as opposed to us, because otherwise I have to go pull the CSS open in order to do it, and then redeploy, <laughs> which is really just not the easiest way to do this. All right. So if this works, based on that, uh, in the on click event function, you would basically just do class list dot toggle. Pink. <coughs> so the, what that will do is if pink, if the class pink is already on the object, it will remove it. If the class pink is not on the object, it will re-add it. Now the only problem is, is our current pink buttons are going to stay pink because we kind of already interacted with them. But you should be able to do this to the new ones. So click. Yeah. See, it is. It isn't even actually interacting with the class. You can see it's actually adding the class to it, but my inline styling in here is not taking effect. What's that? It should turn pink. The problem is, is that I need to add it to the actual style sheet, and I can't do that without. Doing it locally and then redeploying. No, for the style sheet in the, uh, this particular project, we use made pink, right? So in the toggle, it should be made it pink at the. Oh, yeah, no, you're 100% right. Yeah, no, so I'm screwing up. Uh, made. Isn't it made it pink? <laughs> made it pink. All right, let's try that again. Maybe it did work. Do. No. Oh, yeah, it is. It's just... It just changes color when I get over top of it. It is working, though. That's because of Bootstrap. That's all. I mean, this is cool. Ta da! Nice. Good find. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, classlist.toggle will basically take whatever class that you're trying to attempt to apply to it or remove from it, and it will. Remove it if it if it is there, and add it if it isn't. Yeah. And it's cool because um, JavaScript didn't have that for the longest time, which was kind of annoying, because <laughs> it's a really handy feature to have. All right, so that basically allows us to use the event target 
in order to actually access the HTML element we're interacting with, which is really handy, especially when we're dealing with a whole bunch of them, like say in our tic-tac-toe game, for example, we could actually tell which one we were interacting with using the event target. That's what gives us that information. Okay? <clears throat> cool. We talked about event dispatching. So when we interact with the page and trigger an event, the event is dispatched, right? We can utilize listeners to subscribe to dispatched event, events. These will allow us to execute code based on an interaction. For example, when a user submits a form, we can pre-validate their form to ensure it meets our requirements. So this table, like I said before, basically shows you what occurs. So the user clicks on something. The on-click event is executed, it's dispatched, and this just gives you a description of what basically is occurring. So whatever function is applied to that element at that time, uh, registered to that on-click event, will execute. Event bubbling. When an event is dispatched, it bubbles. This means an element that has an event applied to it will dispatch the event. The event will bubble up through the ancestry train, right? So like I showed you with the LIs, if you click on one of the LIs, it's going to bubble up to the UL and fire off whatever registered click event is sitting on the UL. And then the same thing is going to happen to the div that it's currently contained in. And then it will move up to the body and it will keep just calling those events as they're dispatched. So anything listening for that event type is obviously going to execute its registered function. This is important to understand because if you have your element subscribed to a click event and its parent is also subscribed, you're going to wind up with a bubbling issue where when you click the child, it will also call the registered function on the click event on the parent. Okay? This can be annoying because you might be expecting that the child is not working and that's not necessarily the case. It's the, it's the parent function is executing at the same time. So we do have something to stop that. It's called event stop propagation. Stop propagation basically stops the event from actually bubbling up through to the actual parent thing. So let's take a look at both pieces. So I've already selected your two elements for you. So the event for the parent will be called every time due to bubbling. So we're going to register a function to the parent's onClick property. So we're going to do parent.onClick equals function. And we're going to pass it the event. Okay. <coughs> and then we're going to change the color to orange. So we're going to do uh, event dot target dot. Uh, let's change the background color. Background equals. Oh, sorry, style. Forgot style. Dot background equals orange. <clears throat> okay, we're not done yet though. Let's uh, finish off the child one first before we actually go ahead and execute that. So we're going to register a function to the child's on click property as well. So that's child dot on click equals function, and it's going to need the event as well. When you put in this parameter? Nope. It's literally, I could call this Bob. It doesn't matter. It's just a placeholder. But what happens is when the event is executed, whatever callback function it's going to invoke, it will pass the event object into it. Just like an argument. It's an argument, right? So whatever placeholder is there to grab it will get populated with that argument. So if you call it Bob, then you're going to be doing Bob.target. <laughs> Right? Just the most common thing you're going to see, you'll see E. A lot of people use E. It seems to be one of the most common. Uh, EVT is another one you'll see quite often. And event is the last one that you'll see. But it can literally be called whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. No worries. Step four, change the color of the currently clicked element to red. Okay, so event.target.style.background equals red. No, you can do either background or background color. It doesn't matter. Background's shorthand because background will allow you to do color, it'll allow you to do URL, you can do image, you can base64 it. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. Yeah. 
and you can also, including with background, you can do red cover, which tells it how to size it, the positioning, its current, um, yeah, the positioning would be like top, center, stuff like that. You can write that all in one big giant stroke. All right, now we're going to execute our code before we actually add the stop propagation so you can see what occurs. Now the idea is that when I click the child, the child should turn red and the parent should stay the way it is, right? That's what you would think would occur. But when you click the child, the child turns orange. And that's because what's happening, the click event is occurring, the event is happening, the event.target.style, so this is not the child, or sorry, it's not the parent, it's the child, but the current function that's getting executed is the parent's function. So on Monday, a student decided to see whether or not both these things are getting called, because that's exactly what's happening. The child function is being called, and that button is turning red. It just happens so ridiculously fast, you don't get to see the change. How could we see the change? How? The console log lines, yeah. yeah, the console log lines should show you that the parent and child are called, but if we want to see that button turn red, all we need to do is add a debugger right before the parent turns it orange. So if you come back, change, just add, just before the event.target, add a debugger. Make sure you open up your... Uh, console because it's definitely going to try to access it. Okay, and then when you're ready, go ahead and click execute and then click the child. You'll notice what color is the child? It's red, and the reason it's red is because it is actually calling the child function. Now it's in the process of calling the parent function, but it hasn't turned it orange because we haven't, we've stopped it. We basically, using the debugger, we've currently paused it, right? Go ahead and click your play button. You'll see it turn orange, and that means it's actually executed the parent now. So more than often, you're going to want to stop that from occurring. You're going to want to prevent it from actually continually uh, exiting or executing the other functions that are above it. And the way you do that, you use something called stop propagation. So what we can do is we can say event dot and this is like one of the worst friggin' method names they could ever choose because more people spell it wrong than you could ever know. It's S-T-O-P, P with a capital P, right? R-O-P, so prop, A-G-A, aga, T-I-O-N, T-I-O-N, <laughs> propagation. That's not even the worst one. There's some that are like, almost 26 characters long. It's like the worst function name ever. Once you've done that, you go ahead and click Execute. Now when you click the child, it will turn red. And when you click the parent, it's going to call the stupid debugger. <laughs> so maybe take that out. If you get this window and you can't figure out what the heck to do because you don't have the nice little play button up here, down in this bottom left there's a play button. So just click it, and it will continue its execution. Go ahead and get rid of that debugger so it doesn't do it again to you. Execute. All right. I am the child. I am the parent. I am the child. I am the parent. Blah, 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 blah. All right. So now things are happening in the order they're supposed to. You'll also notice now, too, when you click I am the child, only child called shows up. And when you click the parent, parent shows up. Now, interestingly, we don't have a stop propagation on the parent, but we don't need it because events don't go bubbling down. They only ever bubble up, okay? So if we had a grandparent, it would definitely affect it, but it won't affect the child, okay? Cool. Let's do stopping default actions and then we'll take a small break. So when we click submit on a form or we click a link inside your browser, right? Uh, what happens when you click a link? Yeah, exactly. It goes to that link. Not a trick question. <laughs> it goes to that link. It navigates away from the page you're on, right? Or 
if they're really nice people and they have some you know self-preservation for their website, they'll open up a new tab and they'll send you to the new tab, right? Um, but either way, it's gone. It, it goes somewhere else. That's not always what you want. Often you'll have like anchor links, which will actually move you to another spot in the page or perform some sort of other action when you click it. And in order to have that happen and not actually refresh the page, because even anchor links will actually refresh the page, right? In order to have that happen and not have you navigate away from the site or refresh the page, we have to in some way stop that from occurring. We have to basically stop their default action, right? And forms are the same way. When a user clicks submit on a form, what it wants to do is take a look at that action attribute that you define, figure out how you're transmitting the form, whether it's get or post, right? You guys have done forms, right? Right. So it's going to go to that action. When you click submit, off it goes to wherever the action is located. Usually it's some server-side script or whatever. To stop that, once again, we need to prevent it from doing its default action. Well, thank God, JavaScript has a way to do that. It's a simple method called prevent default, and it does exactly that thing. It stops the default action from going on. And we can demonstrate it right now. Right now we have a link. Okay, I've already selected it for you. Just uh, we'll do this on the link dot on click equals function, and we need to give it the event. And then in step two, we're going to prevent the default action. Now, before I do that, if you scroll down just a little bit, you see the link will navigate somewhere else. If you click that, don't worry, it won't navigate away from the page. Oh, that's a deep lie. There it goes. Off it goes. Navigating away from the page. This works, by the way. This is what we're building today. If you click start, it does things. You can't hear it, though. Here, try this again. There it goes. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to click the back button so I can go back. Now, I don't want it to do that. I don't want it to navigate away. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take event that we defined as the argument. Oh, you see, I lost everything. Hold on. Here we go. So event dot. What do I use to grab my link element, the thing that's currently being clicked? What property do I need to access on the event? Target. Yeah, target dot prevent default is the name of the function. <clears throat> and then that is going to stop that link from working. Once you click execute, make sure you click execute. So I'll click execute. And when you click it, oh, you dirty devil. Why are you going off to other places? Did I spell prevent? Oh, you see? I made a mistake. It's not event.target. It's just event. <laughs> Sorry. You're preventing the event from doing its thing, not the target. The HTML element is currently saying, what do you want me to stop doing? I don't understand this thing, right? The event. The event wants to know that you don't want to do that. So click execute. Now click the navigate. And you should just say, just saying stuff, not going nowhere. <laughs> so, like I said, if you have, um, say, say you want to load a modal, right? You know what a modal is? So, you've seen them, believe it or not. You've seen tons of them because they're so overused, it's not even funny. You click a button, and a little box loads up. Oh, modal, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're called a modal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, that's usually done using this. So, you click the button, the button's current link address is usually a hashtag. That's usually what they use. The problem is, is if this isn't done, that hashtag does count as a URL. So it will actually go, cool, I'm going to go to whatever page you're currently on, slash hashtag, and your browser refreshes. But that's not what you want to happen. You want to just boot up the modal. So what you do instead is you prevent the default action, so now the link won't navigate off, and now you can be like, cool, now load my modal. And then you Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So now the modal loads up and you can do your form and click submit. 
prevent default again, validate the form, then submit it when you're ready. That kind of thing. I always hear that. Some people say model. Yeah. But it's not. It's definitely modal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, so before we move on to three ways to bind events, because it's a rather in-depth topic, um, why don't we take a break? Because I wouldn't mind a drink, because my coffee is now done. Um, yeah, so let's do that. Let's take uh, 15 minutes. We'll be back here at 8.25. All right, so like most things in JavaScript, which is kind of annoying, there's multiple ways to bind and register events to a DOM element. Yeah, I know it sucks. Like, but they are distinctly, well, two of them are roughly the same. One of them is distinctly different. So we've been talking about the advantages of using event properties. So the way we've been currently binding is with event properties, right? We choose our element. So say we've gotten an element back and we've called it button, right? And on that button, we have on click available to us. This is an event property, right? It's an event property that we're able to access on our HTML element called button. And that's because button is inheriting from the event target. And the event target comes with all these wonderful event properties on them. So that event property is giving us the ability to inherit from that. Uh, sorry, giving us the ability to register an event to it that will get fired off by the event system. And uh, just to give you an idea, if you do console.dir inside your, um, what's this thing called again? Console? <laughs> inside the console, let's do a document, not whatever word that was, document.query selector. And then we'll put our cursor in there. And uh, why don't we just grab the body? So that it returns back the body for us. And I'll show you, if we click this arrow down, right, we've seen this before. We've got all our different properties that are on inside our object, right? We've seen this probably countless times. I don't know how often you guys have actually looked through this to see the other things that are available to you, uh, like child nodes, right? We've talked about that, the node list. Um, that's actually a collection of all the children that are nested inside the body, right? Uh, class list, that wonderful thing we use to be able to grab the classes from, right, that has add, toggle, and remove on it. Um, data sets, which we talked about earlier. There's also things like first child and stuff on this. There's a lot of cool things. But if you scroll down a little further, you'll notice there's a whole list of these events, right, like on abort, on after print, on aux click. Like, I mean, there's a bunch that you probably never use, right? On before copy. How does it know that you... you you're going to copy. That's what I want to know. How, how is it intuitive enough to know that you're about to copy? <laughs> Anyways, whatever. It's clairvoyant. Um, on blur, on cancel, on can play, right? On can play through. I don't know what either of those do. There's our on click, right? You'll notice these all have what value? What's the current value of every single one of these events? Yeah, they're null, right? Which means they all exist. That means that body is currently subscribed to every one of those events. So every one of these events, body is currently subscribed to them. So if the event gets published, it will execute whatever function is registered or whatever value is currently registered to it. Just right now, because the values are null, it's not going to do anything because there's nothing registered to it. So. This thing is called an event property. These are called event properties. That's what we have access to. All these wonderful event properties. There's a limitation to event properties. If you want to register, <clears throat> if you want to register a function on an event property, based on the way properties work, based on how you guys know object properties work, how many functions could I register to an event property? You think as many as you want? How many have a different, does anybody else have a different answer? How many, so register might be the wrong word. Why don't we use the word assign? Assign feels a little better. How many values can you assign to a variable? Just one, 
How many values can you assign to a property? Just one. So how many functions can we assign to the property? Just one. One. So you can kind of see a limitation there, right? Because you may want more things to occur when that click event occurs. You may not just as want this one thing to happen. You may want 200 things to happen, right? But at this current point, if you change the value of the on click to a new function, you're replacing the old function. It's gone. That registered function is gone. It's no longer registered. You've deregistered it, okay? Right, that's where we get into something else. There is another event target method, and it's called add event listener. An add event listener will let you actually add as many registered functions to an event on an HTML element as you choose. Okay? There's some caveats with it as well. So, for example, one issue with it is when you register in an event, if you register the function anonymously, so in other words, you don't give the function a name, you just do an anonymous function, that function is there to stay. You can't get rid of it, you can't remove it, there's no way for you to eliminate it without destroying the HTML element. That's the only way for you to get rid of it would be to remove the HTML element. Once the anonymous function is registered to the HTML element using add event listener, it is there forever. If you don't necessarily want it to be there forever and you eventually do want to get rid of it, you have to give it a named function. That is the only way to deal with it. So we did take a look at callbacks. You can pass a callback as an anonymous function. It's just looking for a function definition, right? Or you can create a name function and just give it the name, right? So as long as you give it a name, you can deregister it. If you don't give it a name, that's there forever. It's never going to be removed. So let's, uh, let's go through some of the examples here. So the event target add event listener is a method available to any HTML element. And unlike event properties like on click, on focus, thank you for jumping all the way to the bottom of the page, you stupid thing. Here we go. It's like a burst out for no reason, really. <laughs> add event listener allows you to register multiple callbacks to the same event. You're not restricted to just one. So let's take a look at the left-hand side here. Singular registered callbacks on a single event. So I've already selected the button, right? And here it says register a function to the button -y. So we're actually going to use event properties to do this, right? So we know how to do that. We just do button -y dot on click, right? Equals function. And just an empty function, right? <coughs> okay. And for demonstration purposes, I've already put in the second one for you. And you're going to need the, this thing open over here so that you can see what happens. And scroll down to where it says execute. And if you click execute, and then you click the button, which is underneath the next block, it says click, you'll see that it says second callback executed. And the reason is, is because this equal sign is your dead giveaway every single time, right? We all know a variable can only have one value. We all know a variable or a property can only support one value. And in JavaScript, functions can be values, right? So we've made on click equal to this function. Then we literally assigned a brand new function to it and said, now this is your function which means this one up here is gone. It's null and void. It's out of there because this is now the function of choice, right? And like I said, that's not something you always want to do. Quite often you want to register multiple callbacks. So that's where add event listener comes into play. Go ahead and put your cursor on line four of that practice block. <laughs> Just above the console log, first callback executed. Should be empty. We start with the same word though. We still start with the same HTML element, button -y. Okay. And we're going to do dot add event listener. Event starts with a capital E, listener starts with a capital L. Now, event listener, add event listener is not a property. 
an event listener is a method, which means it needs parentheses, right? So let's give it a parenthesis. And uh, I'm just going to simplify this. You see this console.log executed? I want you to highlight that and hit Command X or Control X on your keyboard. Okay, if you're on Windows or Linux, it's Control X. If you're on Mac, it's Command X. We're cutting it. Okay? The reason is because I find it a lot simpler when you can see the whole thing get built out instead of us kind of pre wrapping code that's already there. Go ahead and throw a semicolon at the end of that event listener. And then put your cursor in the middle of the parentheses. This is a method, right? Those parentheses are going to wrap an argument list. We know that, right? That's how functions work. When we call a function, when we call a method, we can pass it arguments, right? We all know that. So we're going to pass it two arguments, because that's what the event listener expects. The two arguments it wants, it wants the event that you're going to execute, right? So it wants to know, what are you, what are you listening for? What event are you actually listening on? Because that is the event that we're going to use, and then I will call whatever function you registered to it. And then it wants, you know, my wonderful math f, it wants the function as the second argument. So the first piece is a string. And it's either, it's, it actually has a specific value. It's click. And no, you can't call it whatever you want. It has to be whatever the interaction is. So the easiest way to remember that, just remove the word on from any of the events that are there. And what you're left with is the, the uh, event that will fire on. Okay, so on mouse down, remove on. Mouse down, right? Mouse up, mouse out, mouse in. That's how it works. I will agree that some people are get kind of triggered by that because it's one of those things where it's not consistent, <laughs> right? And I kind of agree with that. It's not consistent, and that does annoy me, but um, that's JavaScript. All right, so the next argument inside our function call is a function, right? You, we have to give it a function definition. Either you can make the function outside of it and then pass it the name, or you can pass it a function internally. So we're going to use comma, right, to signify that we're passing the next argument. We're going to use the function name, and we're going to write the whole thing out, right? And in case you're confused, our value is that whole thing I just highlighted. It's the function structure, right? It's a function definition. The cool thing is, is because it's a function definition, we can go ahead and put our cursor right in the middle of those two curly braces, hit our enter key, and put some logic in there that will be executed when this function gets called. So here's what's going to happen. Button name. Some user is going to click that button, because users like to click buttons. Okay? They're going to click the button. That's going to fire off because we are listening for a click event. Whatever function is here is going to be invoked or executed, whatever word you prefer. And the logic inside the function is going to be parsed because that's how function works, right? So we can go ahead. Incidentally, you could also pass event in here. Why don't we do that just so you realize that it is exactly the same the event system is calling it the same as the event system calls the event property. No difference. <clears throat> so we'll pass event there. And then we'll go ahead and execute the logic inside. So we're going to do console, actually just command V, right? Because we, we already, unless you've hit command C at some point, then you should still have that value kicking around in your clipboard. This is off topic, but just out of curiosity, how many of you have always wanted to be able to go back in time in your copy clipboard and select something you copied maybe two or three times ago? Yeah, almost everybody. <laughs> so there's this tool that I use, and unfortunately you have to pay for it. It's not free, but it's 30 bucks, so it's not really super expensive, right? Uh, it's called Alfred. Whoop, wrong place.
the hell? I feel like a numpty. I can never seem to stay where I need to stay. There we go. All right. Looks like this. Oh, why are you down there? There we go. Uh, so as you can see, these are all things that I've copied and pasted over the last little while. It actually goes back by three months. So I can go back three months ago and paste something, and I can search, right? So I can be like, I can search for something, and then paste that thing that I copied way back three months ago. That's called Alfred. Now, hopefully this doesn't rage you, but uh, it's only available on Mac. <laughs> so if you own a Mac, get Alfred. <laughs> for those of you that aren't on Mac, however, there are options. Uh, what you are looking for is something called a clipboard manager, is the keyword you're looking for. Oh. All right, anyways, totally off topic. Cool, so we have nothing because I lost everything. So give me, I don't know how many seconds it will take me to do this. Five minutes? You really think it'll take me that long to write this out? No. I did? Yeah. You think so, eh? No, it like, uh, doesn't matter. It's a string. I could put it in back text if I wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's do the same thing to the this one. But this time, why don't we wrap it, right, like I just did there? So actually, we could totally cheat because it's literally the same code. So why don't we just copy that, paste that above, badunk, copy that. Paste that below, badunk. I just thought it was kind of funny when I took web development here. I had like probably, I don't know, 16 different instructors over the course that I was here, right? None of them would copy and paste. It didn't matter how close the code above was, we wrote it out again. <laughs> you just consistently wrote it out, wrote it out, wrote it out. I was like, you can save so much time by just copying and pasting. <laughs> And incidentally, we're going to do that again. So go ahead, put your cursor there. Copy the code above. I'm going to use Alfred. Bam. And why not use it again? Bam. Why not? Just flaunt it. When you got it, you flaunt it, right? Favorite part about Alfred has got to be the icon. It's a nice little bowler hat. It's pretty cool. I think you can see it actually. Uh, yeah, right there, next to the little NVIDIA symbol. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead and click execute. And then, how many times before you click the button, how many consoles are we going to get to the screen? Four. Oh, yeah. How many people say three? How many people say four? Right, because I said, oh. <laughs> right. So go ahead and click the button. You're going to get three. And you're going to get three. Oh, I'm going to get three because I refresh my page. But if I click this execute up here and then click, click, I'm going to get four. Does anybody want a gander or a guess of why that is? Because of the method? Yes. Yes, you're on the right track. Right? Two different methods. What two different methods do I use, Mom? Well, I used on click and add event listener. And that's why, right? So the event properties do not get overridden by add event listener. Add event listener is in addition to on click. So whatever you add as an event property is there. Now, interestingly enough, there is a third way to add event items, okay? And this will actually, I can't remember if it overrides. Let's find out. So these are called HTML event attributes. And they're not to be confused with the event properties. These two things are different things. Attributes. ID, name, style, class, value, data, whatever. There's a whole bunch of attributes available in the HTML language, right? In the HTML language, you also have events. 
You can actually put events in line inside your HTML. And then inside a string, you can write code. And what it will do is it will execute the code inside the string, basically using eval. Okay? Eval is evil. Everybody knows that. Don't use eval. Eval is bad, right? However, this is a common thing you will see people do, especially if you're about to delete something and they want to let you know you're about to delete something. So they will say, hey, confirm that this is something you actually want to do. And the easiest place to do that is by just applying it directly as an attribute on the HTML element, right? Okay, if you click this button, you should see the console log say we have clicked. And that is because this is currently bound on that particular button, okay? Incidentally, this button is behind the scenes. <laughs> I just copied and pasted the code so you can see it. More often, you'll see these bound to buttons that may result in destructive operations, right? So they're usually combined with the prompt method. That's inaccurate, actually. They're usually combined with the confirm method, uh, which we explored way back during the library functions lesson. Remember that one? <laughs> what kind of uh, value does confirm return? What data type? Yeah, it returns a Boolean. So we can actually return true or false. And the cool thing about these is if you return true, the on-click event will continue on with what it's doing. If you return false, it will stop it and everything will end. It will just finish its execution. <coughs> so if you click delete, are you sure you want to delete this? Click cancel, nothing happens. Click delete again. Are you sure you want to delete this? Click OK. You deleted it. Oops. Right? <coughs> I mean, people have kind of conditioned themselves to just go click, click. I've even had people say, oh, well, there's no confirmations. And I go check, and there's confirmations. It's just they didn't realize they had dismissed it. <laughs> but. So this leads into the fact that these events that are on this button, this on, click on here. Now, I am kind of curious. I'm not sure if they replace the button's onClick value. I think they might. So we can find that out. If we right click on our little button here, click inspect, not speech, click inspect. <coughs> There's our button, uh, button danger. Okay, so why don't we use that to grab the button? So uh, we'll do document.query selector. Uh, dot button danger cool there's our button now I want to know if it has an on click function and it does so that tells me that that on click function that is the attribute is the same on click function that is in the DOM so this if you set this it will replace the one in the HTML attribute if you set the HTML attribute one it will replace whatever you currently have registered here, and very likely it's in order. Now, the HTML page always loads before this loads, right? So no matter what, this is going to happen after that. So whatever you do in JavaScript will take precedence over whatever you do in HTML. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Removing events, the last step to the whole puzzle. <laughs> so adding events, sometimes you want an event to occur once. jQuery gives you a cool little function, it's called one. You do, do, you, do uh, you select your document HTML element, right? And then you do dot one, and you assign it a click event. And it will only ever execute that click event once, right? So once it happens, it deregisters itself, and that's it. You can't do it again, okay? <laughs> so often you may want to do that. You may want to remove the event once you register it. And that's actually pretty cool and pretty easy, um, depending on what it is. So if you registered the event by using, like, say, the on, like the properties, like the event properties, then it's a little different than if you did it using the event listeners. So if you right-click on the Booyah button, uh, its ID is set to Booyah, right? And we want to remove the event binding. I'm assuming it's on the on click because I didn't write anything to tell me what it was on, which seems really silly on my part. Why don't we find out? Let's type in console.log booyah. 
and I'm actually change log to dir. Click execute. And let's go look at the on properties. Oh yeah, you see it's on click. You can see it has a value, right? So if you click booyah, it says booyah, right, in the alert. <clears throat> to remove that, it's very easy. All you do is booyah. Actually, anybody want to take a guess at how we would remove it? Okay, hold on. So you're saying just dot remove yeah. on booyah? So literally booyah dot remove. What will happen if I do? Uh, you're smiling. You know what's going to happen. What what's very bad that it's going to do? Exactly, the button is just going to disappear. I mean, they can't click it if it's not fucking there. So, <laughs> like that works, Mo. It totally works. That's a good way to deregister a function. <laughs> No, so that won't work. You, ah, that's a good question, actually. That won't work, but you're kind of making me wonder something. Because you can actually remove properties on an element. You can delete them. So I wonder if you can delete the event property from it. I don't know. But anyways, no, that's definitely not the way we would want to do that. Anybody want to take another guess? <coughs> Sorry? Sorry? No, we don't need to do it that way either. No, this is this is really, really super, super simple. You set it to null. Yeah, just set it to null. That's all we need to do. Just set it to null because it's just the property, right? And we just give it a value. And if it's already got a function value, then we just have to remove it somehow, right? I mean, we could set it to equal mo. I don't know what that's going to do. I'm assuming it's going to make, no, it just does nothing. See, there you go, just like mo. <laughs> Just ease them up. <laughs> there we go. I mean, totally easy, right? So on click, that doesn't feel really all that creative, right? Like, obviously, we can remove it just by resetting the property. That's totally easy. But what about these crazy ad event listeners? They're a little bit more trickier. So I gave you another button. This one's called Booyah again. If you click it, it says booyah again. <laughs> Actually, it says booyah again. <laughs> yeah. So to remove the event listener, we need to use remove event listener. Now, interestingly enough, I added an event listener to this, and I will be completely damned if I can remember how I did it or what I called it. So give me just one small second to go see what I did. Oh, interestingly enough, I bet you it's sitting in the code. We're looking for JavaScript here. Somewhere there should be JavaScript. I bet you I called it Booyah. It seems like something I would do. Strong div. Oh, see, found script tag. Bam. Uh huh. I called it Booyah. All right, so all we need to do is remove that event listener. So this is very simple. It's literally just the exact same as how you would add it. So if I went add <coughs> event listener, all right, on the click event, and the function was called booyah, right? To remove it, I just need to change one word, remove. Other than that, it's exactly the same. You still have to give it the click event, you still have to give it the name function, right? But that's the key piece. If it was assigned, if an anonymous function was registered to it, you cannot remove it. The only way to remove it is by destroying the whole element. Unfortunately, that's just the way it works. However, if you do it with a named function, you can just do it by calling the name inside so there, and it'll remove function, it. Right? What's that? That booyah underneath function. That yeah, it's a function oh, underneath the scenes. It's a function. If you want to see that, actually, you can. Uh, over in your browser, if you just type in booyah, you can see what the function definition is over there. <laughs> if you want to execute it, you can just type in booyah and add a couple parentheses. Booyah! <laughs> so go ahead and click execute. And now you shouldn't be able to click booyah again. It should no longer work.
All right. What's that? I'm reading the last one that you have. Last time, I promise. <laughs> All right. This is almost as easy as removing callbacks. Removing from the HTML attribute, I'm sure you've already come to realize that the HTML attributes on click is exactly the same as the event properties on click, so how do I remove it? I just set it to what? Nine. Exactly. I just set it to null. So go ahead, click Booyah the last time. Last time, I promise. And I do, I promise. All we have to do is literally booyah three dot on click equals null. Execute. And it works e no more. Cool. I mean, that is literally an introduction to events because events can get a lot more complex. You can do a lot more cool things with events. I don't think I've showed you guys this yet. So this is game. <clears throat> and I, I really plugged it in my Node.js class. <clears throat> and I was like, this game is so cool. You got to get this game. It's going to be awesome. It's going to rock. And I was on like the uh, early subscriber, which I don't generally pre-purchase games on iOS, but I did pre-purchase the game. And I was so pumped for it. Because it looks like SimCity 2000. Like, it looks really yeah. like retro. Yeah. And then I was so disappointed because so many things were wrong with it. Like, a lot of the stuff was kind of crappy in the background. However, let's, uh, let's talk about this. Get it on Google Play, right? What is it likely coded in? What language is it likely coded in if it's available on Android? Don't know. Exactly, Java, right? And download on the App Store. Cool. What is it likely coded in if it's on iOS? In Swift, right. It's not, though. That's JavaScript. The whole game is JavaScript. Everything. Their asset pooling, how they dealt with physics, how they dealt with the 3D rendering, how they rendered all the little like sprites and everything else is all done with JavaScript entirely from top to bottom. And if you're doubting me, scroll all the way to the very bottom. There's a blog. If you click on his blog, he talks about it. He has all these different things that talks about how he optimized for his HTML and JS. So he, he found out that taking advantage of HTML5 properties and CSS was actually more uh, optimal than rendering everything with JavaScript. So whatever he could offload to CSS and HTML, he did, because it just made better sense. He talks about asset pooling in here as well. <clears throat> like actually once he creates an object, storing it, and then when he needs that object again at any point, he just pulls it from the asset pool as opposed to recreating it every single time, right? Um, talks about his very strong feelings about microtransactions, <laughs> which kind of made me respect him a little bit more, right? That's why I was kind of pumping this game a bit. But it's really cool to see a language that a lot of people are like, yeah, JavaScript, it makes bubbles shake and shit, right? Like that's what it does. It's, it's not really... It's not a programming language, it's a scripting language. I mean, it's in the name, right? JavaScript. It's really cool when you see JavaScript used for things like this, where it's like, no, you can build a full-fledged game using JavaScript. So incidentally, you guys have heard of Unreal, right? And you've heard of Unity, right? So Unreal has their blueprint engine. Their blueprint engine is used for actually creating um, basically like templates of game engines and then using that game engine to be able to create your game. The Blueprint engine is fashioned on JavaScript. Its whole concept is based around JavaScript. Unity, you can program in JavaScript in Unity today and build games in JavaScript in Unity right now. Because at the end of the day, all of this gets rendered back no matter what. It's a nice simple language, it's very quick and easy to learn. And, well, you may argue that, but <laughs> it's very quick and easy to learn. And it's very robust. The, its asynchronous nature allows it to be more um, efficient and less process heavy. Uh, and because of that, it's, it is a really good language to work with. But at the end of the day, underneath the hood, V8 is rendering that back to C++, which is what all game developers love. They all love C++. Um, and it all renders it all back to C++. If it's a Firefox rendering engine, which is SpiderMonkey, it renders it back to C. 
If it's Safari, it's rendering it back to C++ anyway. So everything's getting compiled back to like a mid-level language regardless, and then eventually down to machine code, right? So it is a very powerful language to work with, and understanding the event system is key to being able to do things like that. Now, just one more thing here, p5.js. There's p5.js. Uh, so if you do want to build games like that, you will need, well, you won't necessarily have to need this, but you will probably want a library. So p5.js will get you kind of started. It basically allows you to create your worlds and do the math that you need to do and interact with things like WebGL. Uh, but if you just want to build like little side scrollers like Mario and stuff like that, there's a very cool library called Phaser. I had a student last semester do this, uh, just with what we basically learned in class, and he built a little side scroller that you could jump up and collect coins with, and that's done with Phaser, and it's very simple to learn, and you can build full-fledged games, uh, and then you can use something like Cordova if you want to try to release it to Android or to iOS, right? You could even try to make money if you wanted to. Yeah. So just keep those in mind, that JavaScript is not just web, right? JavaScript can be utilized for anything you want to do, any application. Think about Google Docs, right? Google Docs is JavaScript in the back. There's a lot of freaking JavaScript in that. That's why they have their wonderful API that you can tap into and stuff. Like a lot of these applications you use online are just JavaScript, right? Cool. Simon says, game of memory. Anybody need a break or are we okay? We're okay? All right. I'm kind of curious how this is going to go, because there's a lot of stuff in this one. Let's, uh, let's first talk a little bit. How many people have heard of Simon Says? Okay. How many people know Simon Says as Simon Says, touch your head? Okay. How many people know Simon Says as that thing? <laughs> Just one of you. A couple of you? Okay, so back in the 80s, there was a game that came out, a little game that you would buy. It had big-ass buttons on it, too. They were, like, that big, right? My cousin had one. I was young in the 80s, despite what you might think. I was very young in the 80s. Anyways, and what would happen is you would hit start, and the game would cycle through the colors, and then it would land on a color, and it would play a tone. And it would go beep, and then you would touch the tone. Then it would play two tones. So you would touch the two tones in the pattern order. And each time it would keep adding a new tone to it and you would keep touching the tones in the pattern order and every time you completed it, you would record yourself a point, right? That's what we're gonna build. We're gonna build Simon Says in the idea that you touch them and you complete a pattern. So there's things that we have to think about as programmers, right? Like one, how do we store the random tones that it uses because somehow we have to compare the user's tone selection to the currently stored pattern, right? So that's something we'll have to think about. We'll have to think about storing the user's played pattern, right? Uh, we'll have to think about how we're going to deal with the user, you know, when they hit a tone, we want to make sure that they're doing it in the order, and the second they hit a tone that is not in the accurate order, we want to fire off an event that tells them they lost, right? We also want to tell them that they won. These are all different problems that we need to think out. Do you guys have a class where you actually learn about UML diagramming and stuff like that, where you learn to build application flow? Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, my application flow is a note with, like, bulleted points that are nested. That's my application flow. It is the worst. I never learned UML diagramming. I couldn't be bloody bothered, right? And I tend to be bad for just just winging it, just giving it a go and see what happens. And that's probably been, you know, my downfall sometimes to some coding because y you wind up going around in circles sometimes when you don't really mean to, but hey, whatever. Okay, so cool. We're going to build this Simon Says game, a cognitive game of memory, and it really is. I can get to about 10, and then, yeah, my old man brain kicks in and I forget, <laughs> and then I wind up erring out. Um... So here's the piece that I was going to build with you, <coughs> but I built it uh, without you just because it takes a little bit of time. 
So instead of using MP3 files, right, or WAV files or some sound file, right, instead what I'm doing is I'm actually generating the tone using the built-in audio context library that's in Chrome, Safari. I found out the other day it's also in Opera. It's in Firefox. It should work on your browsers. The only one I have concern about is that it may not work in Internet Explorer. Not Edge. It should hopefully work in Edge. But it may not work in IE. Okay? Just to give you a heads up. But anyways, so the first piece is just my new audio context. I'm just instantiating an object. The next piece is an array of frequencies. And those are not just random frequencies I chose. Those frequencies actually represent numbers. They, they represent keys on a keyboard, right? The notes. The first one I think is like E4, or maybe it's D4, E4, C5, D5. I think it might be. I can't remember. But in case you ever want to change them, all you have to do is look up note frequencies. You look up note frequencies, you'll find a chart. There'll be a whole list of the different notes and the different frequencies, and you can go ahead and change those frequencies out if you so choose to, right? <clears throat> so then I create a function called tone, and the reason why I'm creating a function called tone is because any time we play a note, we want it to call this function and actually fire off the tone. What it does is it creates an oscillator. It creates something to make gain. The oscillator will tell it how the note is played, the gain will basically, gain's kind of interesting. A lot of people are like, gain's volume. Gain isn't volume. Think more of gain as being like pressure, right? So it's how hard the note is being pushed, right? The higher the gain, obviously, the higher the volume, but that's more based on the oomph, right? So be careful playing with gain because you can potentially blow your speakers if you do too much gain. I would just leave these settings the way they are. Um, if you do want to play with one, though, there's one here called sine. Uh, you can also change that to saw, right? So saw is another type of wave. Um, I wish Rick was still here. He's an ex-audio engineer. He could actually give us more information about that. <coughs> then we have our frequency value. That frequency is coming from this list up here. Uh, then we do our ramping. Uh, we connect it. And then we start our tone. So once we do start the tone will actually play. And that happens on each iteration of this function, okay? Then I built you a little random array element. Uh, this is an arrow function, so don't get too confused. <coughs> Basically, what will happen is we'll pass this function an array, and it will return us back a random uh, element from our array, okay? And that's basically that in a nutshell. That's our tone. If you wanted to play with it, you could click Execute. And the tone function should be available over here now. Nope. Why? That's stupid. Uh, I mean, we could always just write it down here. Oh, right. We also have to give it a, a tone. So why don't we give it 367? Whoa. <laughs> there we go. You could give it another one too if you wanted to. Like, try 890. Really shrill, right? Let's turn that down just a touch. I don't need to get in trouble for blowing the, the whatchamacallit speaker. All right, cool. So now you know how that basically works. We will actually go through and code out the rest of the pieces we're going to need. <clears throat> and all the rest of this is basically the same as we've done before. Um, we're going to grab certain elements from our page. So basically in the page currently up here, uh, we have, I'm going to close that out because we don't need it. <coughs> we have a few different pieces. We have uh, the actions, which are the start and the reset button. We have the message, which is where you currently see current score. A message will show up as well. We have the actual score. We have the game board, which are these four things over here. Uh, those are also lights, by the way. Individually, they make up the lights, that kind of thing. So we need all those pieces uh, in order to interact with them because currently these things do nothing, right? They just don't do anything. We need them to be able to do things, so we're going to have to select them. And instead of having you actually inspect the element and do it, I'll just give you the element names, might as well. So we're going to do const actions, and that is going to be equal to document.query selector hashtag actions.
And then there's going to be const message equals document dot query selector message hashtag message sorry. And I'm assuming you can see how this is going, so let's just do some nice old copy and paste. Next one is scoreboard with no capital B, so it's alert case letters. Man V. Next one is score. Man V. Game board. The start. Man B. Lights. And this one's query selector all. So make sure you change that out for query selector all, and it's actually dot light, not hashtag light. And then make sure you click execute so that you save all that. <coughs> and please, I encourage you to use copy and paste. It'll make this go a lot faster. <laughs> So like I said before, we need some way to store the computer's pattern, right? So as the computer creates the pattern, we want to store it. Now, there's no artificial intelligence here. It's not doing anything really that smart. All it's doing is randomly selecting a tone from an array of tones, and then we'll apply that to its pattern. The cool thing is, is the four tones I've chosen work extremely well together that in any order they're played, they don't sound off they actually sound fine every single order. So it doesn't matter what order they play in. And that's also true to the original Simon. The original Simon used four tones that played together in any order, in any combination. They always sounded like a song, basically. So same idea. So we need some way to store that pattern. Now, I'm going to be modifying this pattern so I can't use an immutable scope, but I should use a scope. So yeah, we should use let. And we'll call it pattern state. So let is mutable, meaning it can be changed, but it is functionally, or sorry, block scoped, which means if it's between a set of curly braces, its visibility is only within that curly brace. If you try to access it outside of the curly braces, you cannot. Okay? Uh, in this particular range, it's accessible through the entire scope of our application, right? Uh, const is same thing, block scoped, so you can only access it within the curly braces, right? Uh, however, you can't change it. And var is functionally scoped. Var is basically deprecated. You shouldn't use var. But the idea is that var will scope to a function, but if you put it in an if block, it's technically globally scoped still, outside and inside. But if it's in a function, it's only scoped within the function. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm global scope. I'm sure you can figure out what global scope is. Yeah. All right, cool. So let pattern state equals an empty array. And then obviously we need the player state too. So let player state also equal to an empty array. The next piece we need is actually a setting. And this will tell the program how fast to play the tone. Now, when I first built this, I built it on a, basically it would increment time, right? So every time you got a correct pattern, it would increment itself a little bit and become a little faster. The problem was is unless I fix the audio issues in this, it causes some serious issues with the audio overlapping itself and it becomes very difficult to figure out what notes were played in what order. Okay, because it winds up doubling up a bit. Um, so the optimal speed, and you're welcome to play with this, obviously, 
the optimal player speed, or play speed, sorry, is 800 milliseconds. JavaScript time works in milliseconds, just to give you a heads up. Whereas in Ruby, it works in seconds, which can be annoying. Cool. Next, we're going to use a for loop. And the reason why we're using a for loop as opposed to, say, iterating over the lights, because we're going to iterate over these lights, um, is because we actually need to select them with the, or do we? Yes, we do. We're actually pairing the light up to the notes. So up here, we have our notes, right? See, our notes are up here. And there's one, two, three, four, right? We have one, two, three, four lights. So if you think about indexes, we have from zero to three. So notes zero is the first frequency. Lights zero is the first light. So we can use that to our advantage and basically associate the first note with the first light, second note with the second light, so on and so forth. So that's why we're going to use a regular standard for loop. Because in this scenario, it makes sense. Okay? And we're going to iterate four times. <laughs> Each time, the most important part in this scenario is the i. Because that variable is what's going to give us the index number and allow us to basically associate the light with the note. So we're going to say let light equal lights, the array, or the node list, I should say, uh, at index i. So the first time that will be index 0, second time will be 1, 2, and then 2, and then 3. Then we're going to take the light, and we're going to access one of those wonderful attributes that we were talking about earlier. We're going to access the data set attribute. We're going to give it a new property called note. And we're going to make it equal to notes at index i. So I have a light. I've associated the light with that index i. So the first time it should be blue, I think it is, or green, sorry. Wow, I really have that short of a memory. Green light. And its frequency will be 392, I think. I'm guessing. But I think it's 392. <clears throat> All right, cool. Now we get to do some very wonderful event binding. We want an on down and an up because we want two things to happen that are different. So I don't want to click. I want something to happen when it's up and then I want something to happen when it's down. And actually looking at the code right now, that is stupid. So we're going to do light dot on click. function oh no 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 I'm wrong no I did this on purpose on mouse up sorry mouse down this does make sense because I want the light on I want it to kind of like flash if you hold down it will flash <laughs> so we're going to do light dot class list dot toggle hover dash light and then you might as well copy and paste that and change it from mouse down to mouse up there you go actually it's interesting I have no idea why I did that now looking back seems very bizarre all right. Next, we will have an on click function. So it's light dot on click equals function. We're going to play a tone, and I'm going to get the tone from that data set. So it'll be light dot data set dot note. The player pattern dot push light dot data set dot note. And then I'm going to call a function called evaluate pattern. So here's what's happening. User clicks. This is all user interactions. User clicks on the light. I play the tone, right? Um. 
then the player pattern is going to add that tone to its player pattern. After that, I'm going to call evaluate pattern, meaning every time the player plays a note, I'm going to then evaluate the pattern to see if it matches the current pattern or see if they're at least on track to the current pattern. If it's a mistake and it doesn't match the current pattern in any way, then it will wind up erroring out. Now you have to consider the fact that the pattern might have eight notes in it, but the player has only played one note. We don't want it to error out because obviously one note is not equal to the eight notes, right? But if that first note that they played and the first note in the uh, pattern state are the same, then we want to listen and wait for more, right? Because they obviously need to play more notes. <coughs> cool. So now we're going to create a function. And the function is going to be called play pattern. And I'm sure you can guess what this is going to do. Now here's the thing, we need a copy of the pattern state and then we're going to go through that copy and pop off each one and test it, okay? So in order to do that, we're going to do let cloned pattern equal pattern state dot slice zero. And what that does is slice is an array function. I'm sure we talked about it, but slice is an array function that will basically slice a chunk of the array starting at the index number you tell it to start at. It does take multiple arguments. You can give it an argument to how many um, elements you want it to pass through that it will slice out. Slice is a very common function that you may not have heard of. I think Java might have slice. Go has slice. C++ has slice. But slice is a common thing. Basically, it returns a chunk of an array, okay? But it shouldn't be destructive. So it will turn the chunk of the array without destroying the original. That's the whole point of slice. So we're basically copying our entire array without damaging or mutating the original array. So it still stays intact. <clears throat> okay. I am not going to explain this because we're going to do a whole lesson on it and it's kind of complex. Just copy what I do. No, I don't need that E. That is a spelling error. <laughs> Just a very little bit of an explanation set interval, basically what it does is it will execute the callback after a delay. Okay, So the next piece it needs is the actual delay itself and the delay is going to be the player speed. So it takes two arguments. It takes a callback function and a player speed. <coughs> it also returns an ID and the reason why that's important is because we can clear it. So once we've iterated however many times we want, we can clear it. The reason why this is pretty common to use in games is because you control the speed of the iteration. If we used a for loop, they would happen almost instantaneous, right? Because it's based on the computer's speed. Set interval kind of delays the speed it plays. Cool. So inside here, we're going to say let light equal cloned pattern dot shift. Now that is a destructive function that's going to actually remove the first element off the cloned pattern and add it into light. If we actually have a light, so if we actually have an element that's not null or undefined, then we're going to say light dot class list dot toggle on tone, because we want to play the tone, dot data set dot note, okay, so you can kind of see what's happening here, it's, it's, this is the computer playing the pattern, that's what's basically happening, it plays a note every, every 800th of a second, no, every 8th of a second, no, 20th of a second, no, I don't know, 800 milliseconds, there you go, that's what you get for me, okay, and then we're going to add something called set timeout, 
Set timeout works exactly the same way as set interval, except for the difference is set timeout only ever executes once, but after a delay. And again, it takes the same arguments. It takes a function definition and a time. So we're going to give it 500 milliseconds. And in this, we're just going to do light dot class list dot toggle on. So basically, after half a second, we're going to turn the light back off because the first toggle will turn it on. This will turn it off after 500 milliseconds. So after half a second. <laughs> Did you ask a question, Mo? Yeah, for the timeout, is there going to be a capital O or just a regular O? It's, a, it's, a, it's just a lowercase o. Oh. No. I think timeout is one word in, an, in the English language. I'm pretty sure it's one word. I mean, we could always ask Google if we had. But. <laughs> All right. So that's going to play our computer pattern. So our computer is constantly adding notes, right? And then we're going to play that pattern. That's that whole point of that function is to play the computer's pattern. That's it. If you wanted to test it, you could always load the player, or sorry, the computer pattern, the pattern state array. Just load it with a whole whack of tones and then call that function. And it will just play all those tones. Cool. Cool. So we want to be able to reset. So when the user clicks reset, actually, you know what? Let's back that out. We're not going to do reset because we're going to run out of time if we do reset. <clears throat> let's do evaluate pattern. And let's do it with the anonymous function version. There we go. I mean, it doesn't matter if you want to do function evaluate pattern. It's exactly the same. It really doesn't make a difference. First thing we want to do is convert the pattern state to a string. So we're going to say um, let p state to string, I'm going to call it. And it's going to be equal to pattern state dot map, which takes a function. Why do I keep writing? colons. Inside the function, we're going to give it an argument. And what it's going to do is go light.dataset.note, like so. So what map is going to do is it's going to take each one of these lights. It's going to access the data set property and the note. Then it's going to return that back to map, which is going to plug it into P state. It's going to build an array of notes. Because you have to remember the pattern state is currently an array of HTML elements. But we don't want the elements. We want the notes. We don't give a damn about the elements, right? So once we're done, we need to convert it to a string. So just after the closing parentheses, make sure you add to string. Okay, and I'm going to show you why. In JavaScript, an array with the exact same elements in the exact same order is not equal to another array with the exact same elements in the exact same order. Okay, so if I have an array with one, two, three, and I make it equal. You can see I've done this once already. Two, one, two, three. It is equal to false. Does anybody want to take a random guess at why that is the case? So let's go back to references and values. When we have a reference, right, what is a reference pointing to? Exactly. And the location in memory, I don't know if you remember this, but we talked about it. It's actually an address, right? So what we're actually saying here is take this memory address, and does that memory address equal this memory address? And no, they don't. They're completely different memory addresses. So they will never be equal. Any object comparison, 
any reference comparison will always equal false unless it's equal to the same reference point. Okay, so if I was to store one of these, right, and then say A is equal to A, that will always be true because it's pointing at the same reference location. So that is totally fine. But this one will never be true. So the way around that is to call, is to convert it to a string, which now makes it basically a value and not a memory location and those will be true. So that's how you do a rate comparison. Okay? Cool. Because if you weren't confused before, you sure as hell are now. All right, let's move on. So we've converted our pattern to a string. We needed to do that. So now we can actually make a comparison between them. So we can say if player pattern dot to string, because we have to convert it to, it's also an array, is equal to p state to string, right? So if these things are equal to each other, then what does that likely mean? The user has gotten what correct? The pattern. They've gotten the pattern correct. Yeah, exactly. All right, pattern state dot push. And here's where we're going to use that wonderful random r l and we're going to pass it the lights so here's what we're basically saying if the player pattern is correct awesome we're going to add a new light to the pattern state right because we're ready to go to round two we're going to reset the player's pattern to zero because they need to start all over again we're going to set tally equal to number score dot text content. Whoops, score dot text content. I can type fast. It's accuracy that seems to be the problem. And then we're going to say score dot text content is equal to tally plus equal one. So essentially, we're adding one to score. I mean, there's another way we could have did that. I don't know why we did it so convoluted, but whatever. <laughs> then we want to play the pattern again, right? Because we're ready to start playing the pattern. And we're going to return from our function. And I'm trying to remember why I returned. We had to. I can't remember why, but we had to. Cool, so that's our evaluate. Now we're actually ready to set up the rest of our, oh, I see why. No, I totally see why. It's because we have some more code inside this function. <laughs> that's why we returned. So if the player pattern to string does not equal the pattern state, then we need to actually allow the player, um, right, we need to actually check and see that the player's pattern currently matches the pattern states at least whatever elements are in that order, right? So if the player has entered three notes, those three notes need to match the first three notes of the actual pattern state. If they don't match the first three notes of the pattern state, then they lost, right? Because it doesn't equal the same thing. So we need a for loop to do that. We're going to use let i equals zero. If i is less than the player pattern dot length, then i plus plus, okay? And the reason why we're using this instead of of is because I'm going to use that index to make the comparison between the two arrays. So I'm going to use the index to reference the value at that current index number and compare the two. So I'm going to say if player pattern i does not equal pattern state i dot data set dot note the message dot text content equals game over home slice and we can actually break 
because I mean, there's really no reason to continue on if they've lost. We're not going to continue to compare the rest of them. Does that make sense? We're iterating over the player pattern, and we're comparing each player's chosen note to the note that's currently at that same position in the pattern state. We are really relying on the player pattern and the pattern state to be in the same freaking order. <laughs> okay? Which is fine. That's, that's totally a normal thing. If we have time towards the end of the semester, maybe I'll show you guys the number, or not the number guessing, the, um, the phrase guessing game, which also relies on things being in the same correct order. Yeah, and it's even more intricate. All right. Now we're ready to start the game. So we need start dot on click equal play pattern and not play pattern with opening and closing parentheses, just play pattern, right? Because exactly, it's just the function definition assigned as the registered function to the on click event. Then pattern state dot push and we're going to add our first random R element from the lights. So we're adding our first light. And then make sure you click execute. Ninety-six lines of code. And we could probably even condense even more of it. I mean if we used arrow functions we could make it even smaller. Right? And I'm not saying that that's the best algorithm either for this, because there's probably some better algorithms out there. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit, just in case you're missing any pieces of code. Once you've typed in pattern state dot push, turn up the volume on your speakers a little bit. Click start. Make sure you've hit execute first. Click start and see if it plays a tone. I hear tones. To which line? <coughs> you likely have an infinite loop. Oh God! You yeah, you very likely have an infinite loop. <coughs> I would kill that uh, tab, <laughs> or your browser is going to crash. Are you good? You're not good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so give me one second. I'm just going to copy this. Command C, Command N, Command V, Command S. Hold on. Save this to my desktop. A desktop. Uh, Simon says complete. Save. Replace. Let me quickly go to our daily class file, browse my computer. It's totally weird. When I get into like narrative state, I just start narrating yeah. mundane crap that I'm doing. There we go. Submit. Cool. The Simon Says is up online as well, if you want it. Uh, you can literally submit a broken copy. It doesn't matter. Just submit something. I'm going to click execute and see if mine works. Based on the tones I've heard, mine should work. <laughs> That's it, eh? No more. Come on, play. Well, isn't that interesting? I mean, I want to see this thing play, so. Oh, really? That could be the issue. There we go. Oh, I need the desktop. That file I uploaded is broken, by the way. I'm going to fix it.
I love how when I select a different file, it removes the name I chose. Because, yeah, I must want to replace the name too. Okay, so the file that's up there now is correct. If you grab that file and paste it into your code block and hit execute, you should have a working version of Simon Says. <laughs> you gotta let me fail. <laughs> That's excessive. <laughs> See what I mean though, the tones are perfect, like they just work very well together. Two, three, four, one. Oh, nice. Oh, what did I make it to? Twelve. I mean, not bad, eh? Anyways, that's all I have for you. Feel free to copy and paste that into your lab to receive your marks.